Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, September 23rd, 2019 Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. If you could all rise and join me with the Pre Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Doreen, could you please do the roll? Nicholas McGee. Here. Rachel Henriksen. Here. Roger Bealey. Here. Robin Saunders. Here. Richard DuPerry. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Here. Rick Meinking. Here. Thank you. We've got a full board this evening. Uh, approval of the minutes, September 3rd, 2019. Those were sent via email to everyone. So moved. Get a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have any discussion? Close discussion. All in favor? Make sure that is unanimous. Thank you. First item on tonight's agenda is A plus tents and events LLC request an advisory opinion for a miscellaneous appeal for an expansion of a non-conforming use, 370 Payne Road, Assessor's Map, R38, Lot 5. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is located in the B3 uh, zoning district at 370 Payne Road. Uh, so the applicants applied for a miscellaneous appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals for an expansion of illegal non-conforming use as single-family dwellings are not an allowed use within the B3 zoning district. In accordance with the zoning ordinance, before making a decision on any miscellaneous appeal, the ZBA shall refer the appeal to the Planning Board for an advisory opinion. The advisory opinion should be based on the non-conformance standards found in the zoning ordinance. To the applicants proposing to build a 1,800 square foot garage to be used as an accessory to the existing residential structure. And staff has reviewed the materials uh, provided in and provided the board with several comments uh, for your consideration, including building design, stormwater controls, and proximity to the shoreland zone. So the applicant should be sure to discuss these with the board tonight. That's it. Thank you, Jamel. The applicant, just introduce yourself and the project, please. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Jason Haskell with DM Roma Engineers. Uh, here to talk to you tonight about the uh, 30 by 60 uh, residential garage expansion to the uh, 370 Payne Road. Uh, here with me tonight is um, Mark Tibbetts with A Plus Party Tents and Events, the, act the uh, property owner, and uh, he'll be available for any questions as well. Uh, the par property currently contains an existing uh, single family house, which is used as a rental property by A Plus Party Rentals, or A Plus <laughs> Tents and Events. Um, at the time of the construction of this, single family house. It was actually an allowed use, but over the years, it was rezoned into the business B3 district, making this a non-conforming uh, uh, property. Um, the applicant is now looking to construct a 30 foot by 60 foot uh, two story garage with carport uh, overhang, um, which will be accessory to the house, uh, which will be used for storage for the tenants and to make it a much more attractive uh, feature to any future, potential future uh, tenants. As I previously stated, the single family residential use is not allowed in the B3, so to extend the residential use, uh, it will require the ZBA's approval as a miscellaneous appeal. Um, as in this rendering, The architectural design is uh, more or less uh, like a rustic barn with the game, uh, gambrel roof, uh, with the working, I guess it would be the, the, hay, the hay style doors on the second floor. Um, and right now the, or the proposed color is to be more like a, a burgundy red, so a little bit uh, maybe more of a, a, a darker than a normal red, uh, barn red. Um, there will be no proposed water or sewer connections, which will not increase any of the public utilities or put any strain on them. Uh, all around, the extension of the residential use in this area um, will have less impact um, than the surrounding commercial properties with respect to utilities, traffic, and the stormwater generation. <clears throat> So as I was looking up and down the street, I saw these other two commercial buildings, uh, which are allowed in the zone. 
and the style of the buildings are more or less kind of in the same realm as what we're proposing. Uh, the top one has the same, uh, I guess, uh, barn-like features with the, the hay doors in the top story, the red colors, and then also both, both facilities look like almost like a residential structure, a single story structure. So it will, for the most part, fit in with the surrounding businesses. Um, as part of uh, the review from the uh, town staff, we have also added uh, uh, the requirements for, oh, I, no. Nope. Excuse me. Uh, roof line drip edges so that everything that comes off the roof and the, the portion of the gravel parking lot will actually get into these roof drip, drip edges and provide some sort of treatment or, and erosion and sedimentation control. Um, we have, it was also brought up that it was, the property was in the shoreland zone, um, which is depicted on the plan as this darker line up along the top and there's no proposed development within the shoreland zone. Um, so the, we're here tonight to answer any of your questions that you may have and hopefully um, a positive uh, recommendation to the zoning board. Thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate your time. Um, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here that would like to speak on this item, please approach the podium, state your name. All right, seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. I'm just going to open this one up to the board in general. Um, does anyone have any questions, concerns, thoughts? Robin. So I appreciate um, the applicant's representative talking about that there will be no uh, development in the shoreline zone. But what will you do to ensure that what the staff has asked is that there's no construction or disruption inside the shoreline zone? The, well, one way we could do it is have it either <clears throat> flagged, staked and flagged for mm -hmm. during construction, or we can add another row of silt fence mm -hmm. that would more delineate the edge of the shoreland zone to keep mm -hmm. the construction away from the mm -hmm. shoreland zone, mm -hmm. if that would be acceptable. I was wondering if staff would, does staff feel comfortable commenting, or is there any further um, conversation that's needed regarding staying outside the shoreland zone? I think from our perspective, as long as they st stay outside of it and mm -hmm. do not disturb anything within it, I think we'll, we're generally comfortable. I, I think <clears throat> that's a great offer to do the double silk fence um, that's keyed in, not just posted in. <clears throat> um, that would be great. And um, <clears throat> so you talked a little bit about the architecture. I'm in the uh, general residential character of the area. I'm, I don't have any questions on that. Um, but how, other than those drip line trench features, what other stormwater controls are you planning? Uh, mostly because it was only, because the majority of the site's already gravel. Mm -hmm. So, or not the majority, but there's the majority of where this barn or garage is going to be placed. Mm -hmm. is already impervious area, except for a small portion of the gravel <clears throat> parking lot, which will be directed towards the trench. And then all the, sediment the sedimentation controls will be in place. Mm, is, hmm, is this within the MS4 area? I guess I'm wondering for staff if they know. And if any of the stormwater runoff will be directed to um, the roadway or the town's right of way. I guess that's my question in general is, is if okay. any of the stormwater will be directed to the town's right of way. Everything, for the most part, drops off back towards the uh, the shoreland zone mm -hmm. for the, for in okay. general. So that's well, well, probably the direction it will be okay. flowing in. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Rachel. Yeah, um, first, one of those picky little details. If you look at cross-section AA, uh, 
if you notice, uh, before you take this to the uh, zoning board, um, you have this actually set up as a mirror image. Okay. So you, you kind of need to re reverse that. Yeah. Yeah. I did I notice that. But. Um, <clears throat> how big is the original house? It's, it's approximately 800 square feet. And you're proposing as a an addition, an accessory dwelling, something that's 1,800 square feet. Correct. Um, which leads me to the question of, given the space and the setup that you have, what guarantee is there that a tenant, since the purpose is to be more attractive to tenants, right. doesn't use that for commercial use, since essentially uh, you've indicated there's both storage and a shop there. Um, that lends itself to commercial use along a commercial road. Sure, that could be something that's written into the lease agreement. I think, I think that would be appropriate because otherwise it would be very attractive to somebody who wanted to set up a small bus oh, sure. business yep. given, given the size and, and the location. Uh, otherwise, if somebody does move in and it's commercial, we have a question of additional impact that we would have to take a look at. Right. And that's all my question. Thank you, Rachel. Is there any other board member? Rachel, uh, Mr. Roger. Sure. Um, do, you, do you have uh, the existing house? Is there not gonna be anything done to it? Is that correct? Correct. Do you have um, any, any uh, I photograph did, of I it? Did not, I did not create, uh, take a picture okay. of that, no. Um, I'm all set, I was just kind of curious about that. Thank you. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, can you, uh, obviously it's going to be on, oh, got to do my homework. It's going to be built on a slab, correct? Correct. And you can confirm there's going to be no floor drains or anything in that slab? Correct. Okay. Thank you. There was, there was none on the architectural plans, and there's no chance that a floor drain would really work out there. <laughs> Jen, did you have some? Um, just a clarifying question. The, the use of this, again, is just for just an accessory to go along with the house that's currently being rented as residential. Is that right? Correct. OK. Any other comments or questions? <coughs> All right, so um, I think our recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals um, as long as you incorporate the staff comments um, and also the things that you've discussed and agreed to here with the planning board, incorporate that with your submission uh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I think we would pass along a positive uh, endorsement of the, the plan as it stands. So, Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good time. Next item on tonight's agenda is Jay Chatmus requests a final subdivision review for 34 New Road, Assessor's Map 35, Lot 17. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to change the... So this is located in the RF and Aquifer Protection Overlay Districts at 34 New Road. Uh, so the board granted preliminary approval uh, for this project back in... Uh, your last meeting in early September uh, for a six lot conservation subdivision. And really the only remaining element that warrants discussion this evening is, or that staff believes warrants discussion, is the proposed wooden guardrail along Snowy Owl Lane. Uh, the Public Works Department uh, wrote a memo and continues to recommend the applicant install a steel guardrail due to their concerns about the wooden guardrail being damaged uh, during winter operations. So the board should be sure to discuss this element tonight. And staff is comfortable with the remaining elements uh, being addressed um, administratively and has provided you all with a draft motion for your consideration this evening. I'll stop there. Thank you, Jamel. So this sounds to me like it's a, I will put a guardrail in made of steel or I will not. <laughs> <laughs> if Please only introduce we're black and white like right. that. Yes, go ahead. Introduce your project and your name. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. Here this evening, um, it would be our pleasure to be able to represent Mr. and Mrs. Chapness, who are here this evening as well, regarding a, uh, a request for final approval for this particular six-lot subdivision. As Jamel has already mentioned, there's really not a whole lot to it at this point. 
What I'd like to do, there's a couple of things that I would like to address, but basically uh, in the memo before you, the bottom of the first page and the second, uh, everything on the second page, all those bullet items, no problem. Okay to every one of those. Many of those are standard conditions anyway. Uh, they're either already on the plan or will be, so there's no issues there whatsoever. So coming back then to the, uh, and also the requested waiver, the we talked about this last time with the uh, 22 feet of the pavement versus the 24 feet, that's not really an issue. So there really leaves only two things. That is the, uh, the guardrail and the sidewalk. Uh, as far as the guardrail is concerned, uh, we had just a, a brief uh, impromptu meeting with staff and essentially, yes, we recognize the need for the guardrail. We're still working with Mike, uh, with the uh, uh, Director of Public Works regarding the type of guardrail. Um, he had actually suggested in a conversation we had last week that there might be a different type of guardrail that we could put there that would be something less than industrial steel, which is just from an aesthetic standpoint, it's just, it's horrible looking basically on a subdivision of this, on any place, but necess it's necessary when you're traveling 60 miles an hour down a highway, 10 miles an hour into a dead end subdivision, not really the case, but he also, admit, well, I'm not gonna put words in his mouth, but essentially it was more the concern of um, he wants to make sure that the municipal equipment, when, they, when the road is actually uh, accepted by the, by the town, uh, that if there's any damage to that guardrail based on basically plows, uh, pushing snow up against it if it cracks, that was his biggest concern that he didn't really want to be, or that he didn't want the town responsible for having to replace those. So we've got a couple of different options that uh, we are discussing with him. The point being is that as far as the board is concerned, yes, we will have a guardrail there. The type of guardrail we will work with the uh, Department of Public Works and end up having that in place, acceptable to the uh, DPW and the staff long before the town or before the uh, road is actually turned over to the town for approval, just by way of explanation to the board. The other issue that I'd like to bring up, the only other issue remaining is the sidewalk. Um, we do have, we did get the waiver for the sidewalk. Uh, that was in lieu of an in lieu fee. Uh, and the only thing I'd like to bring up there, and Rachel, I'm gonna look at you, um, as far as uh, that fee is concerned, we don't have a problem specifically with a fee and a lieu fee. We don't expect to get something for nothing. But in thinking about what we're doing here, um, what we'd like to propose, and I'm still gonna look at you, is if we put in the pathway, the, the wood chipped pathway that we were talking about, which is about um, almost 2,000 feet of it along the backs of these uh, the lots that are on the right, the multiple lots, that would give people a little bit more of a passive recreation area, something to use. It would be a place to gather, particularly in the off season, but it would also be a ski area. Some people could gather there um, as far as people in the neighborhood. And uh, we'd be happy to do that, but what we'd like to do then is from the area, and I'd like to point this out on your plan behind you. Sorry, this pointer only works on this particular, uh, uh, on this particular section. So what we'd do is from about this section right here, all the way down through this section over here, we would have a pathway, and uh, a wood chipped pathway to get people kind of into the woods, be able to have them use it, let them uh, do what they will for a passive recreation all in this section. And then from this point here, would be the area that we'd like to be able to pay the in-lieu fee. The only reason is that $25 per linear foot, based on the uh, linear footage that we have out here, is going to equate to about $32,000 in uh, additional fees as far as the in-lieu is concerned. If it were a 40-lot subdivision or even a 10-lot subdivision, that becomes all relative, it's not a big deal. For a six-lot subdivision, <coughs> an extra $30,000 becomes a fairly substantial deal. The point being is that if we could if we could start this guard or the uh, the fee the in lieu fee for the distance from about this point down to here, we cut that down to less than half, which means that instead of about thirty two thousand, we'd be looking at somewhere around twelve to fifteen thousand. We again understand that we don't want to get something for nothing toward that end, but if we were to put in this trail so that everything up here, from a safety perspective, from a sidewalk perspective, from people utilizing a different way to be able to access the street or the pathways around it where people can meet uh, recreationally, et cetera, we'd just like to be able to start that, that uh, calculation from this point on down to New Road. That's essentially it. If the board would acquiesce to that, then I think pretty much we're done. And given that, I'm happy to address any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. We have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If there's anyone here that wants to speak on this issue, please approach the podium, state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll kick this off. Why not? I know Rachel's ready. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I so I um <clears throat> I traditionally don't, um, and I think over the years it's probably been uh, noticed that in small subdivisions that don't really go anywhere in particular, I don't have a propensity to acquire the sidewalks when, I, when we're not forced to. Um, you know, that said, if I were to look at this project, that corner being maybe a safety issue, um, maybe I could see a section of sidewalk going in on that corner. So your, your proposal to only pay a portion up to getting around the dangerous point of the bend, I find, I find relatively acceptable. Um, I think that's fair. Um, that's my personal take. I'll let other board members jump in. I'm glad to hear that you're willing to work with town on the guardrail. Uh, to get to a point where you're both satisfied knowing that the town has to operate there and is ultimately going to be responsible if they damage that. Mm -hmm. So appreciate that. I'll let uh, Rachel go next. Well, you just threw me a curve. Um, I, I should point out that um, it's not really an either or when we start talking about placemaking and open space. Uh, so I do... Uh, like the idea of the pathway and a place for people to gather. I'm not sure I see it as a trade-off for a sidewalk since the issue for me about the sidewalk has been the children walking down that area to get to the school bus. If the school bus does not come up the, uh, through the whole development and for high school kids it likely will not, uh, certainly for the elementary school kids. So uh, it's an intriguing uh, proposal, um, but I would have to ask the town how the town, and that would be Jamel, um, how the town looks at that sort of a quid pro quo, because there's something about that that I really don't like. Jamel? Thanks, Rachel. Um, <laughs> it's definitely a new one for, for me, at least. Um, I don't know if Angela wants to jump in, but um, it seems like it's really a, up to the board whether they feel like the pathway would suffice instead of a sidewalk. The idea of the in lieu fee is to contribute funds that could be used uh, probably in this part of town for a sidewalk in the future. Um, I just don't know really if staff can offer, um, can have an answer for you guys for, for, for this. It seems like a... Are you comfortable or are you not? Sorry to pin it back, but I don't know if you enjoy it. The only thing I would add is that um, there's always the option for you to build the sidewalk rather than in lieu fee. So um, if it seems like you could do it cheaper, I have not found that you can build a sidewalk cheaper for, than I think our fee. I think we've, we're pretty much almost half just because we look at it as public works building a sidewalk, which is... Um, we already have the labor and the equipment sitting there. I mean, materials is a different thing. So um, I think our, our rate is a lot lower than having a contractor do it, but also you'd have a contractor mobilized on site. So there's the option there to say, is it cheaper? Is there other options to do it on site uh, to build it yourself? And, and I guess I would just offer from, you know, maybe the question sort of historical, you know, what, what's the board done in the past? I'd say I've seen us take a lot of different approaches, but all sort of starting with the concept of complete streets. Where, where, and when is it viable to bring sidewalks in and other and think about other modes of transportation? And then it's really about the characteristics of each project and looking at the density, the scope. I think, as you know, uh, uh, Mr. Fisher alluded to, is there a difference between a six-lot subdivision and a forty-lot subdivision, and and the location of those subdivisions? So. Um, I guess I would say, you know, as Jamel had already said, it really is at this point going to be sort of put back to you as the board and what your comfort level is. Um, I think, you know, from the town's perspective, it, you know, I think based on the conversation I remember hearing the last time, the board seemed generally comfortable given the limited number of units out here thinking about the in Luffy. But if the board feels that, you know, sidewalk is is, is uh, makes more sense out here, then certainly we'll act at the direction of the board. Yes, go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I think, to me, the question is, are we willing to do half of the in lieu fee? That really is the question. Um, in return for their building, um, 
the walkway around the development as part of the open space that's contemplated in the ordinance. Uh, so that's, that's my struggle. Uh, and part of the concern about, as I said before, about the, the sidewalk is children walking along it. Uh, we are aware that there is a potential for expanding at some point uh, in the future and adding to this development. And I, the decision that we make tonight uh, then impacts what happens to the rest of the development in terms of sidewalks if it is indeed expanded for another five or 10, or ten houses, there would be no sidewalks. Um, I'm just, as I said, it's something that, that I'm struggling with. Do we, what do we trade? And is it, is it actually a trade? Because there are some suggestions that the trail would be appropriate. Uh, we certainly have talked about that. Um, and at the same time, we are looking at, so I accept your offer of a trail, but we are looking at the, uh, the question of the whole of a sidewalk or half a sidewalk or half a fee. Uh, and that's the dilemma that we have. Robin, looks like you were getting ready there. I am so ready. Go ahead. Um, so let me ask a clarifying question then. Is the, um, or in, in a lot of neighborhoods, we have to do sidewalks on each side of the road, correct? And in this one, ha has there already been a concession that there's only sidewalk on one side of the road? No, there's no sidewalk. That's already been done. The board's already decided that. That there will be a sidewalk? No, that there will not be a sidewalk. That's what the in lieu fee was all about. So what we're talking about here is if we were, because one of oh, the conversations we had last time yep. was it would be nice to be able to have some place passively recreational in the conservation area, et cetera, um, which does have a cost to it. And again, I know that cost doesn't enter into decisions, but it, it basically oh. does. Okay. Um, well, in, so. in my opinion, then, um, we've already negotiated Well, that there may be a path and that it's $32,000. And quite frankly, to not get too crass here, I, I we're in... Um, Ordinarily, this is an environmentally protected watershed. Is this not in the Red, uh, the Red yep. Brook watershed? Mm -hmm. And we've already said that, you know, it makes sense for the Red Brook to have, you know, a path versus two sidewalks. But in my opinion, the, the uh, safety trumps the environment every time. And a child's life is far more important than $32,000. So I'm unhappy already that you have the in lieu fee. So I'm, I'm about you having to pay the in lieu fee. And I, I apologize, developers, but it is the cost of doing development in, in Scarborough. Um, this is a, an area of Scarborough that's gonna be on the rise. We're seeing a lot of development in this area, and so the connection and continuity is gonna need to be there, whether it's a path or a sidewalk. And um, I feel like we've already negotiated, and so $32,000 is the way it needs to be. Thank you, Robin. Roger. So, so really the question is uh, 32,000 versus half of that and a path. Yes, basically. That's what it comes down to right now. Um, I think I tend to agree with Nick. I, I got to tell you, I don't see a need for a sidewalk on this development at all to start with. So that's where I'm coming from from the very beginning. <clears throat> I'm not even sure you need a, a, a path there either. I think it would be organic by the people who live there eventually if they want a path. Um, in an area like this, I, well, I don't want to get into the sidewalks again, but I think it's a reasonable compromise that you're, you're offering, so. Jen. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to expand on what Jay mentioned, which is um, thoughts about the town's complete streets policy. Uh, um, actually, just a question, do, you, do does, um, are there plans, even sort of high level, to further build out this lot? Um, at the or, request or to of add additional, additional lots to the subdivision? There's no plans to do that at this point with this property owner. Um, let's be real, though. At some point over the course of the next half a century, that's right. beautiful, developable land back right. there. So somebody, eventually they're going to divest themselves of the property, and somebody will probably come in and do that. 
but there's no plans for that in the immediate future. Okay. Um, so a six unit subdivision on with a with a dead end street like this, you know, the volume the volume of traffic, the speed of traffic, the type of traffic coming in and out of this street, uh, presumably, these, you know, these will be single family homes. So somebody's pickup truck or a moving van or, you know, what have you. Um, I, I, this is not the type of street that I think needs a sidewalk either. Um, and the fact that, so, so we've talked about that with the, with the in lieu fee. Um, <clears throat> But the, you know, even, even building a portion of it, I just took a quick look around um, this general area on the map, and um, there's no other sidewalk to tie into. There's nothing, at least at, on this version of the view that I'm looking at, there's nothing on New Road, there's nothing out on Running Hill Road, and there's actually even another subdivision nearby, similar um, number of homes at Quick Glance that doesn't have a, a sidewalk either. So. The, um, the contribution from this in an in lieu fee to the town, in my opinion, would probably be better served in a place where um, these people are more, uh, more people are likely to use it. So for example, yes, you may have kids coming out of this um, development waiting for the bus to use that as an example, but Maybe there's an area, maybe there's a crossing closer to the school that they're going to that, all, that needs improvement that would sort of, uh, in my opinion, be, you know, m perhaps a better use of those funds, um, not just for the people that live there, but sort of the town in general. Um, and so, you know, for that reason, I think, um, you know, I think if the, if the in lieu fee was calculated based on the full length of the sidewalk, then that's probably what, um, you know, what we should be looking at. The, I do have a question about the path option, though. Is that something that would be, that would not, that would all be on private property, correct? No, it would be off the private properties in the common area so that anybody who is within that subdivision would be able to utilize it at any point. Okay, but not within the public right of way? <clears throat> not a, well, people can invite the members of the public and friends or what have you, but no, it's not typically open for the average person to come up and park on the road, get out and walk around and then leave again. Okay, so that's where, that's, that's the issue that I have is that if, if the full amount of this fund, these funds were to be used to build a sidewalk, the, the whole length of it or, you know, down to New Street, um, <coughs> sorry, New Road, um, that that would be something that would be both technically available to the public but also, um, logically available to the public does that make sense whereas a path that kind of looks like it ducks behind someone's house might not be as inviting um, for for someone unless there was adequate signage or something like that um, so I guess without um, you know without sort of identifying that the option that you've provided which is that of a path plus the sidewalk unless that path is going to be identified in a way that's as clear as a sidewalk that this is space available for everyone to use um i would also vote in in favor of the full um in lieu fee we could toward that end if i may um we have no problem about putting signage there it's not like the public can't go there they just typically don't Sure. But um, if in lieu of a, a not having signage because they don't know that it's there, that's easy. And we'd be happy to put up a little, like a Greenbelt Trail sign type Something of thing. Something like that. You know, um, that, that would that identify that. Sure, that's if, not a if, problem If at all. the intent is to provide, um, you know, a recreation amenity to residents and, um, you know, and to the greater benefit of the town, whether that be neighbors across the street or, you know, friends that are coming to visit or what, what have you, um, I think that would be a good way to... To do it, just making sure that it's a, it's widely available to everyone. That was exactly the premise that we came here this evening with, is to say, you know, we'd love uh, signage is fine. I didn't really think about that, but that's easy, and we can certainly do that. You know, and it doesn't that. have to, it wouldn't have to be huge, but you know. No, but an arrow trails. saying, you know, green belt path. Well, I wouldn't say green belt, but uh, you know, um, woods trail pathway on both ends type of thing. That would be fine. In fact, that's actually probably a, that's a good idea, just to be able to let anybody know that yes, this pathway into the woods is actually yours to be able to utilize. So that's not an issue. Really, the whole thing comes down to a matter of money. And I know it's not supposed to, but it does. And there's a pretty significant difference on a subdivision of this caliber between 
basically what equates to around thirty-two thousand dollars and less than half of that. It's not huge, but it's significant. And that's really the only reason why we're still here, just kind of debating this a little bit. So we would just toss out there that we'd be happy to construct the path, which will actually take several thousand dollars as well, but that's fine, um, because ultimately the developer would end up saving the better part of about twelve to $15,000, which is fairly substantial. What, what type of maintenance do you foresee on something like that long term? Um, it typically has to be maintained in far, as far as being uh, cleared of uh, any other vegetation that would come up through it over the years. And if anything falls over it, it would be maintained typically like the green belt is maintained. We'd need to make sure that we go in there as often as possible, but typically once a year anyway. Uh, and the homeowners association is responsible for that. So they would have to take care of that. Thank you. Rick Manking. Yes. Um, as a concession for the uh, no sidewalks, you did agree to put in a street light at that corner. So to me, that takes care of a little bit about the safety issue. Um, we agreed that this subdivision uh, does not need a sidewalk, and I feel that it, that's true. Um, compromise is a nice thing to do. And a solution such as the one you proposed seems to help those people that are going to live there and be an attractive feature for them. And it's their own little neighborhood, and I think that's a great thing. And, um, yeah, the, the compromising so that uh, six lots and six families can live in Scarborough, to me, sounds reasonable. So I'd be in favor of the path and the, the uh, half fee for the sidewalk. Thank or you, Rick. Your half. Can I, is it piggybacking on some? Yes. It is, I, go ahead. Rachel, go ahead. No, she's, uh, she's got to piggyback yeah, um, on Yeah, in terms of what Rick just said, I'd like the idea of the, the Greenway, uh, Green Belt, um, Something that we might want to look at adding to that might be a, a pull-off area where somebody who does come from the outside can park a car to walk around. Otherwise, we would see um, anybody coming in simply parking on the street in what's already a narrow street. Rick Perry. Um, I'm just going to comment on that sidewalks because everybody else has. So um, as far as the sidewalks go, I agree with Nick that um, a sidewalk around that corner <coughs> for safety is makes a lot of sense. And I think what you indicated you were going to stop the sidewalk is too close to that corner. It needs to go, you know, um, 30 or 40 feet around that corner, I would think. Well, it, it would typically, the, the in-lieu fee that we were talking about would, right now is calculated going all the way from New Road uh, all the way up to the end, would now basically go from New Road here up to essentially where this first lot line is. So this is only a calculation. So essentially from here down to here would be that linear area upon which at $25 a linear foot, we would end up being uh, paying the, the in-lieu fee for the sidewalk. What we're asking is that from this point at this first uh, lot right here up to the end because the pathway within the uh, woods pathway would then go all the way around this um, is that that's okay. the area where we would pick up where there where the right. pathway basically takes over from the in lieu fee okay so i'm sorry i misunderstood i thought you're maybe from nick's in initial comments i thought that your intent was to actually put a sidewalk around to that first lot but what your intent or what you're saying is that you'd want to not put that sidewalk in and then pay approximately half the in lieu fee because you're putting in a path? Yes. Yeah, I'm not for that at all, honestly. Okay, well, the sidewalk's already so the, gone. So I understand the in lieu thing, that we've already debated that, and that's fine. I mean, that's already, that's already been decided, I guess. So, um, but waiving the in lieu fee for a path, I mean, I don't know where that goes. As far as from standards and organization, if we say, okay, they don't have to pay half the in lieu fee because they put in a path, what if the next person doesn't want to put in the in lieu fee because they're going to plant rose bushes up front or something? I know I'm being overly facetious, but 
either you put it in the sidewalk or you pay the in lieu fee, in my opinion, and I would much rather see the sidewalk, but if, if we agree to an in lieu fee, then my feeling is that I wouldn't start waiving fees for, that's my opinion. Thank you, Rick. Can I just add on to that, that <clears throat> this is a dangerous precedence and I understand the need to compromise and I feel like we already have. And um, when it comes to paying the in lieu fee, you can take that $32,000 and divide it among, among the six lots and that's only $5,000 per lot to have to recoup on per family and that is, I think, a bargain <laughs> when it comes to living in Scarborough and in this area that's um, developing very rapidly. And as far as taking the in lieu fee from another place to, you know, maybe it makes more sense to take it from another place, I, I disagree. Just because there are no street, there are no sidewalks on the street in this area on New Road, that's the burden that the town's going to have to come up with when this area gets walkable. And uh, because we are, it is going to be like this. And I'm sort of channeling my inner Susan Oglis, and and um, you know she's lived, she has lived here for a long, long time, and seen you know it when Black Point wasn't you know the big bicycle mecca that it is, and who knows what will happen here in New Road. And as you mentioned, sometime in the future, this area is going to be developed, and I think sidewalks are going to be a must, and probably within 10 years. And so I think we need to stick to our guns on the $32,000 here. And as Nick mentioned, it is a very, I think it's a very dangerous precedence to set if we try to renegotiate what we've already given for compromise. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, so I think everyone's weighed in. I'm not hearing much support for your proposal um, to split that. Um, for, you know, for what it's worth, um, I'd like to separate the issues. Um, you know, the first question we had to answer was, do they need a sidewalk or not? And my mind was immediately no. And, and, and that's kind of where, so if I'm not going to require a sidewalk, why do I need to ask for more money? And that's the, the way I was approaching it. I don't think it was a, <clears throat> an attempt to circumvent any or start any precedences. But if, if it's not worthy of a sidewalk, why are we asking for the cash? Again, that is my two cents. Um, I live in a neighborhood with over 48 homes in it, not a sidewalk to be seen. We walk those streets uh, with kids, and I'm talking 30 plus kids at a bus stop every morning. And for whatever, I mean, it's just not an issue. Um, so a little bit of that, uh, my feelings on this comes from my experience living in these types of neighborhoods that don't connect to anywhere. So even if this did see an expansion, I'm not sure it would have reached the threshold. I understand the need for these ordinances and what the town is trying to do with the interconnectivity, the complete streets, all of that. Um, but I still like to think that we have that little bit of rural main nature in us um, and that we can, we can manage some, some street walking on our own. So anyways, uh, that said, you don't have the support uh, as far as I can tell um, from this board to uh, reduce or modify the in lieu fee. We have a motion here prepared and I am prepared to put it forward. Uh, we can go into further discussion after I read all of the, uh, the findings and the conditions, if we need be. So bear with me one second. All right. I move to approve the project titled Witten Woods Subdivision, proposed by Jay Chatmus, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Northeast Civil Solutions, dated 919, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. The applicant is proposing a six-lot residential conservation subdivision at 34 New Road. The subdivision is located within the RF and aquifer protection overlay zoning districts and is further identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map R35, lot 17. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the subdivision adequately addresses the requirements of the, of the subdivision and zoning ordinances. Waivers. One, permit the requested road width to be 22 feet instead of 24 feet. Conditions. One, all future development on tax map R35 lot 17 shall be accessed from the proposed future right of way depicted on the subdivision plan. Two, prior to the release of the mylar, the plan set shall be revised to address the following. A, provide a guardrail detail along Snowy Owl Lane acceptable to the Public Works Department for use on a public street. B, spot elevations related to driveway culverts shall be provided to ensure that each are meeting A, the minimum pipe requirements of a 15-inch diameter, 
B, adequate cover of not less than 19 inches, and C, the roadway cross slope continues to the driveway culvert location. C, a revised plan note specifying that the contractor will install the town standard LED Cobra light head light fixture. D, the proposed split rail fence on lot one shall be extended to the property line. E, a revised design of the private way, Marlin Lane, that meets the private way standards. F, updated plan notes S14 and S15 with the appropriate information. G, an updated plan note on S19 as the town of Scarborough does not provide any maintenance of snow removal or private for private projects regardless of their pending status as future public streets. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. A, pay the in-lieu fee in the amount equal to the estimated construction of a sidewalk along Snowy Owl Lane. The funds are to be directed to the town's multimodal reserve account. B, execute and record a maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater management ordinance. C, address the review comments in Woodward and Curran's memo dated 9-19-19. D, revise the homeowners association documents to include a provision requiring the maintenance of a split rail fence or other hardscape feature demarcating the stormwater feature within lot one. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, prior revisions of a building permit. The applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, pay the recreation contribution fees. Five, prior relations of any certificates of occupancy, a professional engineer must provide certification that all BMPs proposed at the site were installed and are functioning as intended. This includes the proposed drip edges associated with the single family <coughs> dwellings. Six, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and their site contractor and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Do I have any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? All opposed? I have four to one. You propose, thanks. Thank you. You show Jen is dissenting. Item number seven tonight, Patriot Realty Saco LLC requests a final site plan review as part of a contract zone proposed for 101 Higgis Parkway, Assessor's Map R052, Lot 5. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this project is actually located in an approved contract zone at the corner of Payne Road and Higgis Parkway, uh, adjacent to the exit 42 interchange ramp. So the town council approved the contract zone in March 2019, uh, subsequent to the board granting preliminary site plan approval uh, back in February of this year. So as a reminder, the applicant is proposing a 21,265 square foot motor vehicle sales repair and service facility and is seeking final approval uh, this evening. So as requested by the board in February, uh, the applicant has provided addition, additional landscaping uh, provisions along the Highgis and Payne uh, street frontage and staff has recommended that the applicant provide additional tree plantings within this area and a detailed analysis of the existing trees proposed to be maintained and pruned. So the applicant should discuss these recommendations uh, with the board this evening. In accordance with the approved contract zone agreement, the applicant is proposing a town of Scarborough uh, masonry sign at the corner of the property and the town has agreed to facilitate the design and construction of this uh, feature. The applicant will be required to provide the funds equal to the construction of the sign uh, to the town. Staff also has some concerns about the proposed lighting on the site. The lighting plan depicts extremely bright lighting levels that should be reconsidered. Uh, staff has also recommended the applicant reconsider eliminating several lights within the rear parking area and reducing the height of the fixtures. And the applicant has also modified the location of the full access driveway along Highgis Parkway as requested by the town's traffic consultant. Uh, given the anticipated impacts to the adjacent intersection, the town's traffic consultant has also suggested several imp improvements, including modifying the existing phasing of the signals, enhancing the proposed traffic islands, and providing additional signage along the Highgis Parkway. The applicant will also need to provide a copy of their main DOT entrance permit and their approval for the proposed Highgis Parkway improvements. Staff would also like to note the applicant did provide their main DEP, uh, approved main D DEP permit uh, with this submission. And staff has provided the board with a draft motion this evening uh, with conditions for your consideration. Thanks. Thank you, Jamel. 
Uh, if the applicant would like to introduce the project, um, we've seen this a few times. Maybe you can update us a little bit on what's changed, what's been modified, and then, of course, uh, touch on the high spots here on the staff side, especially the main elements that you need planning board input and direction on, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Seymour. I'm a civil engineer and project manager at Sebago Technics here this evening representing Patriot Acura. Uh, Jim has done a great job introducing the project, um, but just to touch base on a few of the items that uh, we've uh, acquired since our last meeting in February. Probably the largest was the main DEP permit. Uh, one of the larger aspects of that was the DEP asked us to go, Robin, you'll like this, above and beyond uh, the normal. Um, there's been some considerations with Willow Brook, uh, uh, Willowdale Brook out there with some high concentration of chlorides. One of the things they asked us to look at was one, reducing our winter sanding operations, and two, uh, which is a, a different tactic than we've seen recently is to actually discharge all our treated storm water directly to the brook, not to the wetlands upstream of those brooks. So the plans have been modified to show those changes and in talking with uh, Patriot Acura, they have agreed that they will not use any sand, uh, any salt, sorry, uh, for their winter um, operations to reduce that impact to the stream. That was one of the larger uh, considerations that we had to work out with the DEP. Other than that, a lot of the things with DEP were technical in nature, and as you can see, we had an approval that you've been uh, forwarded. Um, I, going through, I'll just jump right into the staff comments because I think those reiterate some of the concerns that we've, we've had all along, uh, or the board's had all along. With regards to the trees, this evening I've passed out um, a quick rendering, which is the one you have here, which incorporates all of the locations that uh, Staff had pointed out they wanted additional plantings. We have added more plantings in the back in those islands, and we've added more plantings uh, along the front and along um, some of the sides coming from um, the view from the corner. Um, we put oaks, maples, a, a series of native trees in there to help buffer and substantiate the buffer that will be slightly diminished with the work that we're doing in there. I think the toughest item that we're, we've been struggling with all along has to do with the inventory of trees out there. It's just, it's a forest right now, it's simply put, and there's a, such a broad range of tree sizes and species out there. Um, we're totally amenable to making that a condition that prior to any cutting or anything that will provide an inventory or at least an infield marking of all those locations so that the town can review before we actually start construction. Um, I think that's probably the easiest way to conduct that because, like I said, there's, there's such a, a broad spectrum of sizes and species out there that it would take thousands of uh, survey shots to collect all those. Um, and I think that's what uh, was requested as far as prior to start of uh, construction. Um, moving on, um, as far as the buffering goes along Hygis and Payne, um, we do and have shown throughout that we're going to maintain a, a pretty substantial uh, buffer of natural trees and, and natural vegetation, uh, a no-cut zone, um, primarily from the entrance um, here down to the end of our, it will be untouched. Along through here, there will be an area, uh, especially in the right-of-way. Um, the right-of-way actually goes quite a bit off of the uh, marked pavement edges now. Obviously, those are in the right of way. We have no need to cut those. Those will be retained. Um, and then we've also supplemented plantings here and along the Payne Road. Um, one change that we've made is with the utility connection because it was going to be kind of a cut through here. And talking with the sanitary district, we're coming through the opening here and we'll be tying into the sewer on Hygis. So that'll reduce one of the openings along Payne Road. Um, with regards to the sign, um, we did provide the town uh, an estimate of what we thought that sign would cost, and it was around $63,500 that we'd be contributing to the town. Um, one of the comments that came back would be request to get an actual um, consultant or, or contractor price on that. In this climate right now, it's very difficult to get people to bid on something that uh, they may not be building. Um, so. Again, we can make that a condition of approval maybe prior to permits when we get closer to having our contractor uh, selected and that bid price out there, we'll have a more accurate market uh, price for that. So we're amenable to that as a condition prior to um, uh, building permits. 
Um, there were, and we have been in a lot of discussions with MDOT. With me this evening is Derek Caldwell, a traffic con uh, engineer with our company, who can get into more detail if you want. Uh, unfortunately, we've been working with DOT and they are so backlogged that they still have not written us uh, any kind of approval. We do have an approval for the entrance, the relocated entrance and controlled opening access, because uh, that was a change from the original Hygis opening, so we do have approval for that. What we don't have a acknowledgement for yet is the lane improvements. And we've been in many conversations with Bill Bray from Traffic Solutions, the town's consultant. Uh, we've had some preliminary conversations with MDOT. It all seems like it's on track. It's just a matter of getting this to the table with the DOT, uh, just waiting for it to come to the top of the pile. And we've been a few months waiting for that to happen. So our feeling is we have a strong feeling that that's going to be accepted. We just don't have it in writing at this time. Um, and as far as Bill's comments with uh, changes and line striping and lane striping and traffic controls were totally agreeable and amenable to all those conditions as well. Um, with the split phase and uh, traffic signs along uh, both Payne and Hygis, we are in agreement that we would do that. Um, I think, I'm um, just going through here quickly. Um, we did ask for requ uh, request a waiver from 25 feet to 24 feet. I believe we've discussed this in the past and, and staff is supportive of that. Um, snow storage areas we have shown on the updated plan. Um, in the back we have multiple areas for snow storage. Uh, as far as multimodal reserve accounts, we are in agreement that we would uh, pay that in lieu of building the sidewalk, which is the conversation you've had this evening. Um, and like I mentioned, we've added trees, we've landscaped the islands. Um, in, re in regards to lighting, we've also agreed that we would have a nighttime phase where those lights would be dimmed. Um, I do think that uh, our consultant who we've worked with is not directly through Sebago, it's through the owner. Um, we've been in discussions with them trying to get updated photometrics. Unfortunately, I was not able to get those in time since the comments came out Thursday. Uh, but we're in agreement that we would reduce those poles to 20 feet um, and we'll look at ways to reduce um, the intensity light levels. I think the only area of, of intensity light levels that we'd like to retain would be those security areas, which would be the front of the building and those along the, the doors uh, for access to the building. The area in the back obviously can be dimmed and probably even some of those in the front, the display areas. But I think overall we're going to want the building very secure and anything that's near the building secure because that's where the my guess is the higher end vehicles would be likely kept. Um, we have met with the sanitary district and reviewed that. We have uh, provided a letter uh, stating that their approval for the capacity. And we have discussed with both the police department with regards to the correct 911 address. That will be 101 Hygis Parkway for the official address for the site. And the fire department has reviewed and we have amended hydrant relocations per his request. I know I may be missing some things and obviously we'll answer any questions that you have, um, but the idea is that this evening we'd like to obtain final with these conditions so that we may be able to put this out to bid and get into construction early next spring. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, this is an opportunity for public comment as well. If you are interested in speaking on this item, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing that, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, <clears throat> Roger, do you want to start this one? Sure. <clears throat> um, glad to see this before us again. I was getting worried. <laughs> um, I uh, I tend to agree with you on the um, on the inventory of the trees. I mean, it's it's a lot of trees out there. Yeah. Um, so uh, whatever you can work out with staff on that, I I would I would go along with. Um, the, um, what, what kind of trees are you going to put in the uh, parking lots in those little islands? Oh, give me just a second here. Those are going to be um, a combination of tupelo and I believe some other um, deciduous trees that would, would not have obviously seeds or any right. kind of uh, fruit or anything like that. Um, that was a concern that both the applicant and um, we had is that we didn't want those getting on cars, basically. So uh, we've looked at the species to try to match it up with what works best with 
uh, inventory out okay. there. Okay. I, I remember that was one of the arguments against the trees before. So um, <laughs> this area, when you're going along the parkway where you have the, um, the stormwater yes. uh, areas, is that, that area in between there, is that going to be lawn or just going to be natural turf? That will be a natural area that will be allowed to come back to its natural state. Um, it may be occasionally manicured, however, in the DP order, you know, we did not mention that as a lawn area, so that will be allowed to come back to its kind of natural condition between the two ponds. And frankly, most of those ponds will grow in over time as well. Okay, in, in the um, in, in, um, staff's comments, I think, um, there was a discussion about the trees cutting the trees up to um, 15 feet? Yes. Whatever trees. Um, are, are they, are you, is staff referring to the regular, the existing trees that are there or the new trees there? It would be the new trees that are planted. Right? Uh, I believe they were discussing the, or talking about the existing trees they were gonna leave along the frontage. So they would prune them so you could still see through sure. to the development. Yeah, okay. Um, but still provide some layering. Yeah. Okay. And, and those, just to clarify, those would be more along the frontage and more along the pain road side. Those from where the ponds are, there's no interest in obviously seeing through to look at a pond. Um, so it's really to kind of keep that front entrance and more towards the pain road side. Those would be thinned. Okay. And I just want to get a clarification from staff. I have to find it here, but you, there was a discussion about the trees in a um, access road. And I think you were referring to off the of pain road. When you're talking about trees defining the entrance to the sort of you know, the right of way or something like that? Yeah, I think I can try and find the comment, but I think the general idea was to provide some street trees along the drive aisles um, within, the, within the development. So the entranceways and sort of along the edges where cars would be driving. And in, in, in the rendering you have this evening, we've shown that we're going to be placing some trees along the edges of the aisles and within the aisles itself. Okay. Is, is staff satisfied with that point? You know, does that satisfy that? Are you satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, that, it, it appears to cover our, our uh, concerns. Um, I don't have anything else right now. I'm just pleased that it's here and things seem to be moving along. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Jen. <clears throat> um. I have a question about your um, the right the truck turning diagram that you provided. So you're not proposing any pavement modifications at the actual intersection, correct? There will be now, and Derek may be able to speak more to this in conversations with Bill Bray, the traffic consultant. Uh, they're talking about some realignment and. There's a multitude of things coming along in this intersection. We're kind of the small fish first yeah. here. Obviously, there's some bigger players that will be coming down the line with some other improvements. But in, that, in those conversations, we looked at ways to realign some of the lanes. Uh, there would be no, I don't believe there'd be any actual pavement work. Would you like to come up? Uh, there would be no immediate pavement work at that intersection. Expanding. Right, so the uh, current proposal is, I think we're refer referring to as the... Uh, the northeast corner where we had the truck turning. Yes, yep, northeast um, corner. Yeah, so that was showing that we were looking at if that uh, the, there's an existing wide shoulder there with the uh, striping in it, if that could be utilized as a dedicated right turn lane. But what we found was that without expanding the pavement, um, a truck couldn't safely maneuver that corner. And right on that corner, you have the uh, traffic control cabinet and the mast arm, so right. it just wouldn't be feasible to right. simply okay. walk. Okay, so the, so the point of the graphic is just to show that a dedicated right turn lane would so, sort of not work or kind of cut it too close, even if the pavement were to be widened. So instead, that'll be a shared right, that'll continue to be a shared right lane, is that right? Well, the, the Hagus approach would not be modified, essentially. That still remain just a striped shoulder. Okay. So, but that can still, you can still make a truck turn there, correct? Without modifying the intersection? Right. So we, I guess overall there would be no uh, modifications to the actual alignment of the roads at the intersection. The only changes would be the signal timing as well as the uh, northbound Payne Road. Uh, we'd be... 
from what our analysis showed, which in Bill Bray's comment was mentioned, was the, uh, at, on that approach, the lane configuration would be changed, but none of the lane widths or anything would actually be modified, just the usage of the individual lanes. Okay, so I guess my, my only question is just to make sure, because I'm sure that you'll be having large trucks coming in here, probably they're coming in off the highway, I'm not really sure, but maybe a delivery up Route 1 from somewhere in Saco, I don't know, um, but just making sure that the, that large truck can make the right turn under the current um, geometry of the intersection without impacting the signal equipment or the other island that's out there. That would be my question. Yeah, I think one of the confusing things is right now it appears to be a right lane. It's actually a paved shoulder, so it's not a formal lane. So you've got... But from the formal lane. Right. From the formal lane, you have plenty of room to make the right turn. Okay. Even with a large... Even with a large truck. Okay. Yes. Sorry. The, I, I now understand what your graphic was intended <laughs> okay. to provide. Um, that was my biggest hang-up. Sorry. I was, I was stuck on that. <laughs> um, other than that, I... Um, appreciate Bill's detailed comment letter on this. Um, and I think that's the biggest question that I had. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Rick Munking. Yes, um, without seeing cut sheets of the fixtures, I don't know all the photos, optics of those, but uh, I have to agree with the staff that there's a lot of over lighting going on here and I understand you want to show show the vehicles off um, but carrying an average of 50 or some lumens is pretty high in that front area and it's going to be and it bleeds over quite a bit and I think we can probably come up with some fixtures that won't have so much bleed over and uh, you actually have more light in front than you do in the back, and that's where the vandalism is likely <laughs> going to happen anyway. Yeah. And I think you're well lit up there. Yeah. Uh, so I would really suggest that um, you redo the calculations for the photometrics and, and provide staff with cut sheets so they can determine night sky and all of that. They, they will issue. be, just information, they are full cutoff, they're LED. Um, and um, it's a corporate, unfortunately, it was a corporate standard, and as you pointed out, they like to light things up pretty intensely. So giving them the Scarborough standard, we've requested that they greatly reduce that impact, especially along the front. I understand, again, that along the building, we'll want some light, but I don't think we need 50-foot candles. That's typical of what we see on the sports fields. Um, so we'll, we'll have them back that off, and we'll provide the town with an updated photometric. Perfect. That's all I have. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Rick Perry. All right. Well, now that Rick talked about lighting, I got nothing to talk about. Um, you know, as far as the lighting goes, I know you, you said you didn't determine which ones are going to be security lighting and which ones are going to be full on as well. Yes, so, I think the majority of the site will be on, will be dimmered at night. Yeah. With the, I think only the front will be the security area and any areas around doors. Right, and I and I have to look at the plan set for that entire area to see what's at, you know what's in that area that's going to be affected by that light, whether it's residential or whatever. But um, yeah, as long as all the lights are dimmable, so um, they all have to have the right you know the right seven pin receptacle so that they can accept the dimming controls. Right. So you get, I don't want you to get down the road and say, well we found out we can't dim them. So right. I'm sure you're going to submit cut sheets to the town and, um, you know, they all need to be capable of dimming. Okay. So they all need to be able, capable of accepting that control. And then I'm sure. Yeah, unfortunately, the one residence is the one that's there now. <laughs> There's really nothing in the vicinity of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not <clears throat> sure which one should be security and which one's could be dim, but I'm sure you'll do a good job in dimming as many of them as you can. Yeah. And I would just say, uh, make sure they're all capable of it. And then, um, again, I didn't review the photometric, photometric plan, but I think they're probably all 3,000 Calvin. Yes. Lights, yeah. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you, Rick. 
Rachel. Yeah, I, I think the uh, plantings that you have passed out tonight go a long way towards uh, uh, the concerns that were expressed. Um, I do think it's possible if you are going to be cutting up to 15 feet, uh, some of the limbs, it would be good if underneath there you planted ferns, shade plants, low-lying, but something that, that actually uh, provides something more aesthetically pleasing than a bunch of leaves uh, that, that could end up there. Um, now, I have a question. I cannot find the snow storage areas. I'm sure they're here someplace. I can't find them. Um, we have located those on the most recent sheet. Um, and those are primarily um, along the sides. All the areas along the sides would be allowed to have snow storage off the edges. I, I don't see it listed. Well, we'll make sure that we have it listed. Yeah, it, it does need to be, it does need to show clearly on okay. here. Any place else? Um, we originally had talked about it at the end, but where we have the stormwater treatment pond, we can't mm -hmm. store it there. Um, in lieu of that, there may be times of the year, depending on inventory, where that back lot may become an actual snow storage itself, or portions of it. Okay. Within the paved area. Right. Just because inventory can drop in the winter, but if it does get too large in the spring, we'll be contracted to remove it. All right, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Rachel. Robin. Um, you had mentioned that there was a no-cut zone, Jim, in, um, near where the wetland conservation area is. Yes, we have a, and I believe I have a, another picture of that. Okay. My, my question really um, is around whether or not there'll be, this will be memorialized in covenants or deed restrictions on the, the property just as a reminder that the, the trees are our best line of defense against flood control in this area. Um, well, it's obviously part of the approval process, but I don't know if we'd have any objection to put in any kind of deed restriction. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'd like to just add that I think uh, you've done a nice job, especially with the improvements to the landscaping side of this. Um, we're, I think we're very excited to see this uh, come to fruition. It's been quite the process, we know. Uh, Multi-phases, uh, multiple years, I assume. Yeah, uh, two years. zone through yeah. the whole process. So, you know, we appreciate you working with the town, going through our, our process. It's never easy. Uh, it can be trying. Um, you've done a very good job of taking comments from staff and this board, the council, and incorporating them into your proposal. Uh, so for that, I'm grateful. Uh, we do have a motion prepared this evening. Um, I will read it, and if we need to discuss any of the items further, we will do so. So I move to approve the project titled Accurate Dealership proposed by Patriot Realty Saco LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics dated 919 with the following findings, waivers and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing a 21,265 square foot motor vehicle, automobile sales, repair and service facility with associated landscaping, parking, stormwater management, infrastructure and other site plan elements. Property is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as R52, Lot 5, and is subject to the provisions set forth in the approved contract zone agreement. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design and site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization, layout, access, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, one. Permit the requested parking aisle width of 24 feet instead of 25 feet. Conditions, one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include A, additional landscaping and tree plantings along the Hagus Parkway and Payne Road Street frontage as noted in the staff review comments memo dated 9-23-19. B, revise the photometrics plan as noted in the staff review comments memo dated 9-23-19. C, additional areas for snow storage. D, additional deciduous tree plantings along the northerly, easterly, southerly edges of the rear parking lot. E, tree plantings and other landscaping within each of the proposed landscape islands. F, additional buffering provisions along the property's northerly border along the parking area and adjacent to the dumpster enclosure area. Two, prior to the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, pay the in lieu fee equal to the total cost of installing the proposed Town of Scarborough masonry sign. C, 
Pay the in lieu fee in the amount equal to the estimated construction of a sidewalk along the Higgins Parkway and Payne Road street frontages. The funds are to be directed to the town monthly modal reserve account. D, address traffic review comments and traffic solutions memo dated 9-16-19. E, address the review comments and Woodward and Curran's memo dated 9-19-19. F, provide approval by the Scarborough Sanitary District. G, provide approval by the main DOT. H, coordinate with the fire department in regards to fire suppression for the project. I, revised plan note number three in the overall site plan to include the date the contract zone was approved by the town council. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall provide a final signage plan that shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall provide a detailed analysis of existing trees along Higgins Parkway and Payne Road street frontages that includes the existing trees, location, size, and species to be maintained and pruned. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Second. I have a second uh, discussion, and I just want to clarify one point on here. Um, I believe uh, staff and, and this board, and perhaps the applicant, uh, on number four, where it says detailed analysis. I think what you're proposing uh, was was fine with staff, uh, not not necessarily a full-blown plan, but essentially. Um, I think what we envision yeah. would be a plan, and then we'd also have markings in the field that could be reviewed with different colors based on what we're doing to those particular species. So I think it's a combination of a plan and a site visit prior to construction. If that's okay with staff, great. So I think we're there. Robin. Mr. Chair, just mm -hmm. my request to prior to perhaps the certificate of occupancy that there will be um, deed restriction or covenants provided regarding the conservation of the of the trees in perpetuity. I have that. Thank you. Are you making a motion to amend, or is this up for discussion before you make that motion? I'm prepared to make the motion. Um, uh, but I encourage you all to discuss, if needed. Thank you. Uh, anyone want to weigh in on having some sort of deed restriction on the conservation area land only? And this is what a, to prohibit any cutting with mm -hmm. a typical exemption for dangerous, dying mm -hmm. trees. Exactly. Would that be? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm okay with the, the uh, suggestion. Anyone else? Yes, Roger. Does the applicant have any comment regarding that? I don't believe we do. I think we would use the standard, you know, vegetated buffer or wooded buffer language from the DEP, which allows exactly that. Exactly. That's what I was thinking, Jim, was the standard DEP language. Thank you. I'm fine. Okay. So we have a motion to amend um, deed restriction. Do, got you. Second. Uh, six, uh, so the number six will be added to the current motion. Uh, Prior to the certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall provide a deed restriction to require the no-cut tree areas remain undisturbed. That's the motion. We have a second, Rachel, I think. And all in favor of amending the main motion, which is unanimous. Okay. So now to any further discussion on the amended motion. No? Okay. All in favor? I'm sure that's unanimous. Congratulations and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, um, with regard to the next item coming up, I have been advised by town council to, I'm um, sorry, council, meaning Board with an SEL, um, <laughs> that I should recuse myself as I am a, a member of the Francis Scarborough Marsh. We appreciate that. Um, and in uh, first alternate is Rick DuPerry. We're going to take a five minute recess real quick before we jump into this. Um, we're going at it for about an hour and a half. All right, we'll return. About six, seven. <laughs>
All right, thank you all again for rejoining us. Uh, our next item on tonight's agenda is Bell Atlantic Mobile of Allentown DBA Verizon Wireless requests a review of transmission tower at 415 Black Point Road, Sessor's Map R103, Lot 17A. Jamel? This is actually Jay. Jay. All right. Uh, uh -oh. Good evening. Um, so I know it's been a little while since, Let's see if I can just get a little less echoey here. Um, since we've seen this uh, before the board, I think it was last in uh, March of this year. So just by way of little background, this is uh, for Verizon Towers uh, proposed tra um, transmission tower on the sanitary district site uh, down on Black Point Road. This is in the RF district as well as the um, uh, the overlay district, which allows for transmission towers. This has been before the board for a number of times, and as you may recall, there's really sort of a three-step process in uh, going through transmission tower review. There's the first piece is the priority of location, um, which this board, I believe it was back in September, actually, of 2018, that the board found that the, tr that the applicant had met the priority of location uh, component or step of the process. The next two steps are really going through the performance standards of the tra um, transmission tower performance standards uh, and the performance standards in the zoning ordinance, as well as the site plan review um, standards. Um, and so harking back to our last meeting, really there seemed to be just a few remaining outstanding items, really with regards to the visual impact analysis, which deals with buffering, height, tower style, and tower color. And I think the board at that time um, discussed the, an alternative location, location B, I think, as we've been calling it, which the applicant is back before you um, discussing, uh, proposing. Um, board felt that that did a better job of buffering. As I said, the other elements uh, to talk about uh, had to do with the tower style. There had been some discussion about using a traditional tower or a monopine. Uh, ultimately, this board felt that a stealth tower would be um, uh, more in keeping with the, the standards, and so the applicant is back before you with that as well. Um, I think what I'll do is I uh, had a conversation with the applicant earlier in the day, and I know they, uh, I think, are going to have some discussion with the board with regards to height and color, and so at this point I might turn, turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, and let, um, let the applicant um, take it from there. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate uh, it. Actually, I did, failed to mention, Jamel made me put it on my comments from before. Uh, we have received uh, uh, dozens of uh, letters, emails, and handwritten letters from the public. All those have been made available to the planning board via uh, electronically, so emails we've sent right along. Uh, letters that have been sent in have been scanned and sent to the board, um, and we have those in the public record. Um, and we have, as uh, the chair had requested staff to do at the prior meeting in March, we have prepared a draft motion that has been distributed uh, amongst uh, some folks, so um, that, is, that is what I have at this time. Thank you, Jay, I appreciate it. Uh, Scott, would you like to introduce the project, your name, and sure. kind of get us the uh, highlights and hopefully some good news? Will do, excellent. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Jay, for the, for the process roundup. Um, Scott Anderson, I'm here tonight with Chip Fredette. Um, Chip and I do local permitting for Verizon Wireless for, for tower sites. Um, as uh, Jay has noted, we uh, started initially, I think as, as pretty much all, most of the board members know, we started originally with a proposal for a 100-foot monopole or monopine that would have been a centralized pole with racks of antennas uh, located on the outside. Um, we had a pretty extensive discussion at the last March meeting, and some of the interested parties had brought together photo simulations. We had done simulations both for our proposed 100-foot tower, um, both in the location that we had initially identified with the sanitary district, and then in this so-called location B that Jay had uh, referenced, which was a little deeper into the existing vegetation. So we did simulations of both locations. We also did simulations of a 120-foot stealth tower, um, so-called brown stick, which is different from the original pole design because the antennas are mounted internally inside the pole, so you don't see them on the outside. That had some uh, consequences for height because you had to go up a little bit higher because you had fewer antennas. At that time, back in March, we had talked about these two alternatives, the 100-foot pole we had recommended with the antennas on the outside 
and this 120 foot stick with the antennas on the inside. And then we also were talking about the two different locations. So at the end of the uh, planning board's meeting in March, I think the consensus of the board um, and the consensus of most of the folks that have been participating in the process was that the design with the internally mounted antennas was preferable and also that this location be a little farther into the vegetation was preferable as well. And the way the board left it was asking Verizon uh, to go back to the sanitary district to see if we could obtain approval from the landowner to make those changes. Um, and again, at that time, we were contemplating 120. That was the, um, the size of the brown stick that we had been talking about and working with our RF engineer. So, um, <clears throat> good news, I think round number one, we were able to go back to the sanitary district and obtain approval from them to do uh, the stick. And actually we had some flexibility on design, but we really needed their approval to change the location to the location B. We are grateful for the sanitary district support and they um, um, approved an amendment to the lease to allow us to put the tower location in the location B. And we had submitted with the September 9th submission that I'd sent in a copy of that lease amendment showing that we've got that right to, to move the tower where the board and most of the commenters and members of the public and organizations wanted us to move the tower. So that went well. At that point in time, we were still working on plans for the 120 foot um, brown stick that we had discussed with the board um, in between kind of the meetings with the sanitary district and when we submitted the revised plans to you, um, the, uh, some of the groups including PNA and others reached out um, with um, a couple of other uh, suggested recommendations and, and requests uh, for the design of the site. One of them in particular was to reduce uh, the tower by an additional 10 feet from 120 to 110. 10. And then we had a more kind of detailed proposal on coloring. We had talked a little bit before at the last meeting that the standard um, color that we normally do is the galvanized gray, which is the color of our neighboring tower right here that I saw for the very first time when I pulled into the parking lot. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times that is the best color because it blends into varying cloud conditions and the like. There was a discussion about doing a kind of a brown at the bottom of the pole and more of a blue gray at the top to try to capture, you know, what will be around those different sections of the tower. And what we had indicated in March um, is that we still think that gray works out better, but um, we're kind of agnostic on color. So provided that we can find a paint color that roughly matches what the board and what some of the commenters have recommended, and we can make sure that our contractors that build these, these sites are able to find you know, it's, it's not necessarily the Sherman Williams that goes in your bathroom trim. It's got to be a little hardier, but um, we've got some flexibility on color. So um, both the, the issue of the 110 and the coloring, we went back to Verizon, <clears throat> and I'm pleased to report that Verizon is, is comfortable um, changing the height down to 110. It's not as great, but it's 10 feet, so it has some additional benefit and will still um, largely meet the coverage objectives of the site. We'll have the effect of improving coverage in the area as has been our goal all along. So I think where that puts us is that <clears throat> we're, we're still kind of willing to do all these different designs, but it has been clear that many of the groups that have been spending their time um, commenting on the project and indication with the board is that the location B is preferable. Um, we're able to do 110 feet, um, which we think is um, uh, um, the, the preference of the folks that have been participating in the proceeding. We still think that the gray is the best color, but we are willing to do a different painting scheme if ultimately the board decides that that is the way to go. Um, on that one item, um, again, I, I, I can't say that we can kind of meet a particular manufacturer with a certain color number um, right here, but what we would <clears throat> respectfully request is that we match the color to that, and if we just get some direction from the board as to it's going to be this brown color here and this blue, sky blue color here, 
then what we'll do is when the project goes to the contractor, we'll require them to match that with the kind of paint that they would need to put on an exterior structure like this and make sure that staff is comfortable that um, we've matched the, the, the color to the greatest extent possible. Um, and also <clears throat> get some indication from the board as to where the brake line is, um, as to when it goes from one color to the other and what those colors would be. Um, uh, with regard to co-location um, and setbacks, those are two other issues that you have before you. We are closer to the property boundaries because we have moved it kind of deeper into the woods, but as Jay has noted and Jamal has uh, noted in the past, the board has some flexibility on that when you find that that location that's slightly closer to the property lines is better and offers more buffering, which I think is the situation here. And obviously we're still more than the tower height distance. Um, right now we'll be talking about a 110 foot pole with a 150 foot setback. So we almost meet the 150% uh, requirement. Uh, for co-location, um, the plans show that there are three bays beneath us, and so theoretically, we don't really know what the coverage requirements are of other carriers until they come to you, but um, theoretically, the pole can, uh, can um, house three additional array bands inside the pole. And just one clarification <clears throat> that I received today from Chip, we have leased this entire area, so another carrier coming on to the site um, we have enough room at the bottom for three additional carriers uh, within the lease area. We only need 35-35. We shrunk the size of the fenced area, but we've leased an area that's sufficient for us and three different additional carriers. And anyone that would come to co-locate doesn't need to negotiate a separate deal with the sanitary district. We have leased up that space and can allow co-locators to go on. They wouldn't need an additional lease from the sanitary district. They would be able to come on to the poll as of right. Um, so I think those are the details. I hope that's two rounds of good news. And um, we're here to listen to any further comment from the public and respond to any questions from the board. And we're hopeful that uh, we've been able to kind of work with everyone in the process to come up with a design that um, kind of runs the middle here. It may not be what everybody wanted, but is a, is a solid compromise on a bunch of things. And um, we're still very, very confident that this is an area that needs um, some coverage assistance and this is a good site and we're in the overlay zone and we're hoping that this is a project that the board can support. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. We have an opportunity for public comment on this item. So if you were here to speak on this issue, we're gonna ask that you uh, state your name for the record. We're gonna allow four minutes per speaker and we're gonna ask that you keep your comments to hopefully something um, that we have not considered. Uh, at the three minute and 30 second mark, I give a little Courtesy tap, which means uh, get to your conclusion, and then when I tap it again, that means you're done. All right. I think I've heard that tap. You have Mr. heard Chairman. this before. Uh, members of the board, my name is Natalie Burns. I'm from Jensen Baird Gardner and Henry, and I'm here tonight representing the Prout Snack Association. Um, I want to start out by saying I'm a little disappointed. I had prepared some remarks for tonight, and I had a lot of drama in them. Uh, I will not be making any of those dramatic remarks tonight. We would like to um, acknowledge that Verizon has relocated the tower as this board requested and as, as uh, PNA and many of the neighbors had requested. Uh, we appreciate particularly the drop in height to 110 feet. Uh, we would like to ask the board to uh, press for a color, and I believe that um, you have our communication from Terry Dewan, uh, who suggested a specific color, um, which was Benjamin Moore 1597 Pebble Beach, which I think is a nice way of saying that it's a, it's a certain kind of a flat gray. We do acknowledge that Verizon may not be able to use Benjamin Moore in an industrial setting, so we'd ask that it be a similar color and that uh, staff be allowed to make the final uh, review of what Verizon can come up with that works for them to um, ensure that it's a, a similar type of color to this. And if not, we'd ask that it come back to the board, but I'm sure they can find something that's very close to that. And I believe that's the overall tower color. I don't think it's two different colors anymore. Um, so hopefully that's, that's an improvement. Um, so, uh, rather than going on and taking more time, I'm just going to say that we'd like to thank the board for having listened to us, for asking for the changes that you asked for, 
and we'd also never thought I'd be saying this, would like to thank Verizon for the changes that it has made. Um, we really appreciate that they listened to us and that they did this. This is an area where a tower is allowed. It might not be our first choice for where a tower would be allowed, but it is allowed, and Verizon had every right to pursue an application on this site. Uh, but thank you to Verizon and to the board for making this a better proposal than it was when we first saw it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Fandel. I'm a member of the board of Friends of Scarborough Marsh, and I'm here tonight to deliver a message from Stephanie Smith, who is the president of the board, who unfortunately could not attend tonight. Um, I might not even need to say this now, but <clears throat> she stated for the board, since you have received a letter co-signed by me and the Prout's Neck Association, I will make my remarks brief. As outlined in the letter, we believe that a cell tower to the height of 110 feet is adequate for its use. The engineer hired by the Prout's Neck Association has done due diligence in reviewing this request and specified a tower height of 110 feet. I ask that the planning board consider this height as the upper limit of what they will approve. Thank you, Stephanie Smith, president of the board. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers this evening? This is a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, with that said, I'm going to close public comments. Um, so I'm going to kick this off. And I'm going to tell you um, thank you, especially to the people in this audience. Uh, you, you fought tooth and nail, and you got this to where it needed to be. And I appreciate all of you being here and voicing your concerns and helping move this project um, forward. And as uh, Natalie had said, maybe it's not ideal um, that it's going to be there. But we've done the best with what we had to work with. So we appreciate it very much so. And Verizon as well. Um, you know, It's not easy coming back through this process for over a year. Um, and revising your plans six to eight times or how many ever. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of work working into this. So um, look, civics works, this is great. So kudos to everyone involved. Um, I'm satisfied with what I have presented in front of me. I don't have a whole lot left to comment on at that point. Um, the only thing I want to just confirm, my understanding too is that the color of the tower would be just one color. Yeah. It. Um, I don't know if anyone here had an, a different impression of that. Any other comments from this planning board or questions? This is just shocking all around. <laughs> We're all a little stunned. Let's take a minute, take a deep breath. That said, we do have a motion prepared. I believe it had been shared with the public uh, as we requested last time out. So um, it is lengthy. So if you've got a blanket and a pillow, cozy up. Okay. I move to approve the site plan amendment project titled Scarborough 2 ME, proposed by Verizon Wireless and depicted on the plan set prepared by Nexus dated 4 1919 with the following findings and conditions. Findings concerning compliance with Scarborough zoning and site plan review ordinances. The applicant is proposing to construct a 120 foot brown concealment. Um, 120-foot brown concealment, brown stick transmission tower located in the leased portion of land at 415 Black Point Road, owned by the Scarborough Sanitary District. The tower and associated infrastructure will be located within the 5,625-square-foot lease area. The proposal also include an approximately 470-foot-long, 15-foot-wide gravel access road with, within a 100, a, I'm sorry, within a 20-foot-wide access and utility easement. Property is located within the Transmission Tower Overlay District and the Rural Farming zone, Zoning District and is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as Map R103, Lot 17A. The Planning Board has reviewed the above referenced application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the project, project adequately addresses the Transmission Tower performance standards contained in the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance and performance and design standards contained in the Scarborough Site Plan Review Ordinance. Zoning Ordinance Section 9F, Performance Standards Transmission Towers. One, priority of locations. A, existing transmission towers. The applicant has provided information about the possibility of co-locating 
on the Black Point Inn, Black Point Fire Station, and Church Steeple at 167 Black Point Road as alternatives to the proposed tower. Based on the evidence provided, the Planning Board has determined that co-locating a tower at one of these alternative locations would leave gaps in service. B, new transmission towers within the industrial or light industrial di districts. The applicant is not proposing a new transmission tower within the industrial or light industrial zoning districts. C, new telecommunication facilities. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that the applicant is not proposing a new telecommunication facility. D, new transmission towers within the transmission over tower overlay district. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that the applicant has submitted substantial evidence and justification and has demonstrated that a location of higher priority under subsections 1A through C above cannot reasonably accommodate the applicant's requirements for coverage improvements in the intended geographical area. Two, standards for transmission towers. A, height. Number one, based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that a 110-foot transmission tower effectively screens and mitigates the visual impacts of the tower from surrounding properties, abutters, roadways, and public spaces, while still providing the applicant's coverage requirements. The Planning Board has ensured that this tower height still accommodates the co-location requirements of subsection 2G below. Two, based on the docu documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that this standard is not applicable. B, minimum lot size and setbacks. One, based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that the standard is not applicable. Two, based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that the proposed location, which results in a decrease from the standard 150% of the tower, total tower height setback to not less than 150 feet from the closest abutting property, will result in better screening and buffering and from surrounding properties, abutters, roadway, and public spaces. C, buffering. One. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that this standard is not applicable. Two, based on the visual analysis, photo simulations provided by the applicant, the Planning Board has determined that the proposed location for the tower is adequately surrounded by a buffer of dense tree growth and vegetation that screens the facility and minimizes its visual impacts from abutting properties, roadways, and public spaces. D, visual impact analysis. The applicant performed a balloon test in December 2018 and provided a visual analysis that included photos, photo simulations of the tower as seen from 11 different locations in town. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined the proposed location, buffering, and style of the tower minimizes the visual impacts to the greatest practical extent. The visual impact analysis has informed the decision related to height and color as stated in subsections A and E of these findings. E, tower style. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that a 110-foot stealth tower with concealed antennas minimizes the visual impacts to the greatest practical extent. The Planning Board has also determined that the tower shall be painted a color similar to Pebble Beach, which is a Benjamin Moore 1597. This condition is read, condition, the plan shall be revised to include a tower color equivalent to Benjamin Moore 1597 Pebble Beach. F. Lighting. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that there is no lighting proposed on the tower or attached antennas. G. Co-location. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that co-location opportunities on the stealth tower design are reduced given to all the antennas, must be mounted inside the tower, and require more vertical space than a monopole tower design. As such, the 110-foot stealth tower has, sufficiently space, has sufficient space to co-locate at least three additional carriers. The Planning Board has determined that this design will result in lower tower height and minimizes visual impacts. H, advertising. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that there is no advertising or signage on the tower or attached antennas. I, coverage. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that the applicant has demonstrated that there is inadequate coverage for the area covered by the application. J, structural standards. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that the applicant has demonstrated that the tower meets all applicable requirements of federal and state regulations and has been designed in accordance with the standards of Electric Electronic Industries Association structural standards for steel antenna towers and antenna <laughs> supporting structures. Condition. This item will be further reviewed to ensure compliance as part of the building permit process. K. Existing towers. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that this standard is not applicable. L, abandonment. Based on the documentation provided, the Planning Board has determined that the applicant has provided substantial evidence and justification that they will remove the facility and associated infrastructure and return the site to its pre-construction condition, including removing of roads and replanting vegetation at their own expense. Condition, 
prior to the issuance of a building permit, a finalized surety shall be provided to the planning department to guarantee the removal of the tower should it become abandoned. This documentation must comply with the provisions of section 9F21 of the zoning ordinance. M, shoreland zoning. Based on the documentation provided, the planning board has determined that the tower is not located within any shoreland zoning district. N, public notification. Based on the public record, the planning board has determined that the planning department provided appropriate notification to all property owners abutting the tower site. Site plan review ordinance section four, performance and design standards. A, site utilization and layout. The design of the tower associated infrastructure has been laid out to minimize the, the, the impacts on environment, environmentally sensitive areas and oriented in a manner to reduce the visual impacts from abutting properties, roadways, and public spaces. B, site access. Given that approximately one visit per month by the applicant's technician will occur on the site, the existing paved driveway and the designed, design of proposed 15-foot wide gravel access road provides for adequate access to the site. C, internal vehicular circulation. Given that approximately one visit per month by the applicant's technician will occur on the site, the existing paved driveway and proposed 15-foot wide gravel access road provides for safe and convenient movement within the site. D, parking areas. Given the approximately one visit per month by the applicant's technician will occur on the site, the proposed parking area provides for adequate parking on the site. E, pedestrian ways, space, and alternative transportation. This standard is not applicable given no pedestrian access will be permitted on the site. F, landscape buffering and green space. Based on the documentation provided, the planning board has determined that the tower will be adequately buffered and screened and the buffering requirement in section 92B of the zoning ordinance have been met. G, stormwater management. Based on the documentation provided, the planning board has determined that the proposed tower and associated infrastructure will have a negligible impact on any stormwater runoff. H, lighting. Based on the documentation provided, the planning board has determined the proposed switch activated light attached with a canopy covering the radio equipment has been designed to balance visibility and safety on the site while minimizing impacts on abutting properties and light pollution. I, architecture and signage. Based on the documentation provided, the planning board has determined that this standard is not applicable given the only structure on the property is a ground mounted cabinet and no signage is proposed. J, private. A public and private utilities. All power and fiber utilities will run underground. The proposal does not include any other utilities. K, outdoor storage. This standard is not applicable given no outdoor storage is proposed on the site. L, design standards for commercial districts. This standard is not applicable given no structures are proposed on the site and the tower is not located in the commercial district. M, preservation of historic and archeological resources. This standard is not applicable given the site does not include any historic or archeological resources. And Municipal Capacity and State Agency Review. This standard is not applicable given the, pro the project is lo not located in a de designated growth area. Conditions of approval. One, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to address the modifications required as part of the board's deliberation and stipulated in the findings above. Plan set to be reviewed and approved by planning department staff. Two, a pre-construction meeting is required prior to the start of construction. Meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, the site contractor, and utility company representatives, if applicable. The pre-construction meeting is to be coordinated through the planning department. Three, no occupancy or full or partial, partial occupancy shall be issued by the code enforcement officer until the town engineer, town planner, or their designee are satisfied that the property has been constructed in accordance with the approved site plan and conditions of approval, or that the town has received a performance guarantee for the completion of specific outstanding site elements within a specified time frame. Four, final approval shall expire one year from the date of such approval unless the applicant has started substantial construction. The town planner may extend final approval for one additional year for good cause, provided a written request for extension is submitted before the expiration of the approval. At his option, the town planner may refer any request for extension to the planning board for decision. That is the motion, folks. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I second that, and I'm glad I didn't have to read it. They may need to hear it one more time. <laughs> Any discussion? Motion and a second. All in favor? I'm sure that is unanimous. And again, thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. So we have a tiny bit more meeting to go here, folks. So just bear with us. Uh, number nine, staff report. 
I have a few items to report on. Um, we do have a mylar that needs to be signed for the Gateway Common subdivision amendment. It's over there behind Jay. We'll set that up after the meeting. Um, a little update on the Larrabee Farm contract zone amendment. Um, there was a joint hearing held with council uh, last week here in this room. And the next step in the prelim, ne next step in the process is a preliminary approval uh, with the board. So we'll be seeing that project soon. And there was a pre-construction meeting for Scarborough Downs phase two, or the innovation districts uh, in early September. So they're, they're well underway up there at the northern end of the Downs. And that's what I have. I don't know if you guys have anything. Mine. Thank you. Uh, administrative amendment report. There was one administrative amendment at the Oak Hill Plaza. Uh, they, uh, we re staff approved a small regraded area with picnic tables uh, for employees. Very slight amendment. That's it. Correspondence. Uh, no correspondence. Planning board comments. Roger. I'm just curious on the um, cabinets to go. Do they have to come before us anymore, or are they just moving a bit along? They've uh, moved past the temporary sales trailer idea, um, <laughs> and they actually have a pre-con meeting scheduled for next week, so they're, they're moving along. Okay. Any other planning board comments? With that, I will make a motion to adjourn. Can I have a second? Rachel? Second. <laughs> All in favor? Sure, that is unanimous. Thank you, everyone. You guys got applause, man.